Today, we're taking you west on conversations to the channel country of far southwestern Queensland through the eyes of a man whose backyard takes in some 50,000 hectares. Angus Emmett is my guest today, and Angus has lived his whole life on Noonbar Station, which is about 140 k's southwest of Longridge. When the rains come to his place, the station can be isolated for up to three months. But you won't hear Angus complaining about it. He'll be out there observing the landscape, which is teeming with life and keeping an eye peeled for new species. Angus Emmett is a grazier with a collecting habit, a habit that's seen him identify new species and made him an honorary fellow of the Queensland Museum. He's fascinated by the Lake Eyre Basin and the life it supports on every level, and he's lived there all his life. It's his idea of paradise. Good morning, Angus Emmett. Good morning, Richard. Great it, to be down here. It is, it is your idea of paradise, isn't it? Your, it where is. You live? I'm very, very happy to be live, living right out in western Queensland. Uh, I head down this way and there's too many people around. Too many people. They're yeah. everywhere. They're yeah. bustling about. Are you careful to guard your peace and quiet normally? Oh, I don't have to guard it very hard. We live... Two hours' drive from the nearest town. We have a few people drop in. Well, we have quite a few people drop in, but there's a lot of peace and quiet. They probably need to drop in by a plane, don't they, if they drop into your place? That does happen from time to time. We have people come via plane and via jet even, and most people by four-wheel drive. We've got a lot of dirt roads, so cars cars can get in in the, in the dry when the roads are graded, but the rest of the time it's pretty much four-wheel drive. You haven't just brought your suit to town. What else did you have in the boot when you came down to town? Oh, as you were saying, I work fairly closely with the Queensland Museum. I've got a fascination with the natural history of the arid zone, of flora and fauna, and geology, archaeology, anthropology. So I, as you said, I've got a collecting habit, and I collect a lot of material, pick up dead stuff on the roads, collect insects, etc., etc., and because we're coming down empty, we're going back full, taking the kids, all the kids' gear home, but we came down empty, so I brought down tubs of alcohol, snakes and goannas and boxes of insects and all that sort of thing. Took you're, them into the museum. You're a roadkill aficionado then. You, you, you pick up bits of roadkill to... to... Oh, I, I certainly do. There's so much valuable material that, lying on the roads. Some of it's beyond redemption, but there's a heap of stuff out there that... If you collect good data with it and collect the specimens, they're really, really valuable in the scientific context. I've never been to Channel Country proper. I've been to Longreach, which isn't really Channel Country, is it? Well, it's just above it. Just above it, yeah. yeah. Um, people from that area become unusually poetic when they're talking about I've seen it on Google Maps, which is not the same thing as being there, <laughs> I know. But it looks spectacular. It looks incredibly... It's, it looks like the surface of Mars, actually. What's it like to be in there? Can you ba- paint me a picture of where it is that you live? I can certainly try. The, the Channel Country is made up of three major river systems. It's made up of the Cooper, the Georgina and the Diamantina, which all flow down and in big years make it into Lake Eyre. And in really, really big years, which are pretty rare, they actually fill Lake Eyre. So the Channel Country itself is this incredibly flat area. And if you follow the Thompson River down south from Longridge, it comes down through our country. And once you get to Windor, it widens out. It goes from being about 5, 10 k's wide up to 80 kilometres wide of floodplain. And you've got this huge flat area. The water spreads over it, and there's only a drop of something like a... I'm talking in the old measurements here, a foot every mile. So the water moves very, very slow, and it's there's all these little channels like blood veins, blood vessels. It's... Scientifically, it's called a, called a braided anastomosing system. But, of course it is. But it's just like these blood veins, and the water spreads out across the country and fills all these wetlands and covers these plains, and you've got this huge inland sea, and it just comes to life. It's just incredible. It's just all the water birds, the invertebrates in the water, the fish, the turtles. It's just it's magic. When, when you say an in, inland sea, you, you, you might get pictures of kind of like waves and whatever, but it's not. It's, it's really like the biggest mirror in the world, isn't it, really? Well, it is like when, it's, when there's no wind, definitely. It can be this huge reflective mirror. You can't see to the other side. But I've actually, well, we might go into it in a while, but talking about our old telephone line, but we used to have to boat across the floods and stand our telephone up so we'd have communication. And in a little tinny, my brother and I are going across the 
a big clay pan covered with water and the wind came up and we're, there we were bailing water out to keep us above, <laughs> <laughs> above the surface. So it can get, you can, can get, get waves. Chopped. Yeah. When you're out there though and it is all glassy, is, is it weird? Do you, do you, I mean, what you're sort of, you've got the sky above and the sky below. I know, you can not, sometimes if it's really still in the right circumstances, you can't pick the horizon. It's just like, it's sort of, it's magic. Yeah, it is magic. It, it, tell me what the colours are of the land. Well, it depends on the time of the day. You, well, going back a step, it's a land of extremes. It's a land of boom and bust. And we go from very, very wet periods through to very, very dry periods. And there's no consistency to that. Hopefully we'll have a wet summer, but there's no saying we will. So at the moment at home, we live in red soil country where it doesn't go underwater. And that's about all we can see at the moment, red soil. There's no ground cover at all. We get the wind and the soil's moving around quite a bit because it's extremely dry. And then you've got the greys of the mulga and cassias and all the shrubs and trees, except... As we go up from the house into the sandstone ridge country, we've got these beautiful ghost gums with snow white trunks and really brilliant green leaves, and that's just such a contrast against the blue sky and the red soils. What do you hear when you're out there on a still day? Um, Nothing. Well, when it gets really dry, bad drought, or lack of rain, you don't. If you move away from water, you hear nothing. It's just, it's actually so quiet that it hurts your ears. I know that's hard to. Well, when your tinnitus comes up, the tinnitus starts to kick <laughs> yeah. in, then doesn't your ears start to ring because yeah. it's too quiet? Yeah, right? exactly. But then in the wet seasons, the country is just alive with noise. All the insects at night, you've got all the crickets and katydids, and during the daytime, you've got cicadas and other katydids, and just this huge myri- myriad of insects and birds, and you've got all the reptiles that survive off these. So it's amazing. It goes from being. In a big dry period, it goes, it's like a ghost landscape, and you get the big wet. And in within days, or even within hours, the whole place comes to life. Within week, within a week, it's all green, and it's like you're on a, in a different universe. It just it just bursts into life. So that's a joyous time, obviously, when it bursts into life. Oh, it's wonderful. And I've heard people that have been all around the world, uh, biologists, and they reckon the burst of life in in the Channel Country of Lake Eyre is equal to any life anywhere, even in high-quality rainforest in the Amazon. They say that when it comes away, like comes bursts to life like that, it's equal to anywhere in the world. When it's not, though, does that test you a bit? Does it test oh, you yeah. <laughs> spiritually? Do, do you do you get lonely when when it's drought and it's quiet? I don't get lonely, but you do get a little bit despondent at times, particularly. Well. Karen and I have got a beef cattle enterprise and trying to make a living when it doesn't rain tests things out a bit so (laughs) you do get fairly despondent in that regard and you're trying to do well it's a juggling act you're trying to do the best thing with your stock and you're trying to do the best thing with your country and you're trying to survive financially in through those periods so it is a real juggling act and you can think oh I don't really want to go outside today it's hmm, not not very nice out there I was talking about this the other day. Uh, you know, they've just re-released the classic uh, Australian movie Wake in Fright. And the opening scene of it is a kind of remote... I, don't, I, I think it's supposed to be Western New South Wales, but yep. there's this kind of 360-degree panorama at the start of it, and it's yep. silence. And, and what you see is a lonely railway station and nothing but red earth. And the impression... that It's like the filmmaker's trying to tell you, this is the hottest, most desolate, <laughs> godforsaken place in the world. How differently do <clears throat> you see that land now? And only 30, 40 years later... Yeah, it's interesting. You ask my better half, Karen, in the middle of summer where it occasionally hits 50 degrees, and she'll probably agree with what you just said about (laughs) being the hottest, most desolate place on earth. But we get those periods, but most of the time it's just, it's a wonderful landscape. It goes from being very wet to very dry, and you've got to live with that, but... Sometimes I think that's the British gaze, if you like yes. the British way of seeing the land. Oh, it's nothing like Kew Gardens, therefore it's not beautiful. I think as a nation, and even people like us living out there, we've, it's taking us a long, long time to get past that British idea of what land and landscape's all about. And 
I think we're only just starting to actually... We, I know we've intellectually realised it's different for a long time, but to actually embed that in how we act and react and manage and live in the landscape, I think we're only just starting to get there. Grazier and naturalist Angus Emmett is my guest on Conversations, who lives in Channel Country in southwestern Queensland. What do you see when you drive through the country? What are you looking for when, you, when you're travelling through your, your property? Well, because of my number of interests, I'm heavily into photography too, very seriously into photography. So I've got my eye open for photographic opportunities. I've got my eye open for what birds are doing what, what plants are flowering, what, what's happening natural history-wise. And that's really interesting. The rainbow beaters are a beautiful, colourful little bird that, head north in the winter, go up into northern Australia and up into the islands. And this year they arrive two weeks earlier than they normally do. They normally arrive about the 12th of September and they're a couple of weeks early. So I don't know what that means, but but that's the sort of thing I'm always looking out for, as well as you're out checking your fences and checking your stock and checking the waters and all the general day-to-day life on keeping a cattle place going. So, so you're aware of what, what creatures are about, what insects and what animals are there. In a way, that's like the, a childlike quality, isn't it, to be re- hyper-aware of the little details? Because the adult eye often glazes over, misskips a lot of that detail. Yes, I've, I've just got... I've, I don't know when I wasn't into natural history. I just That's been my knowledge of it forever. I just always love natural history, but there's quite a few people around that would suggest I've never grown up. Yeah. <laughs> because I just, I still love it, yeah. Is, is the way you see it the, the way most people around you would see the land as well? Probably, well, nearly everyone that lives on the land loves the land and has a real empathy for the land, but I probably see more detail to the species level with the plants and animals, most people don't go to that degree. They certainly look at their pastures and grass species and all that sort of thing, but I've, I've always got my eye out for what's there and what might be new and what might be a range extension being found elsewhere but not in our part of the world. And Because I do have a bit of a knowledge of the scientific literature, I'd, when I see something, I know whether it's worth following up on or not. Tell me about, if you take me a walk around your property and tell me about some of the the creatures you'll, you'll often see on it? Um, well, around the house, the birds are wonderful. It's certainly not quiet at, at home in the mornings. We've got all the corellas and the glass and the pigeons and the crows. and Crows? Oh, yeah. The least tuneful bird song in the world, isn't it? I yeah. don't think there's anywhere in Australia that doesn't have crows. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but uh, we've also got resident families of magpies and butcher birds, and their song is absolutely beautiful. And... A couple of years ago, Karen and I put a big deck out from outside the kitchen and outside of that we've put a big pond and all the birds come in there and we've got native fish and crabs and yabbies and mussels, all that sort of thing in it. And That's just around the house? Well, that's just sitting on the deck and you sit yeah. back and heat waves really good. It brings all the birds in for a drink and you can sit back and we've got... It's interesting, we planted a dead tree at the pond for perching, for the birds to perch on and... We get numerous comments by people that come out to visit, when are we going to get rid of this dead tree? We went to a great deal of effort to go and pick it up with a front end loader and bring it around and plant it. But you can sit back on the deck some mornings, it's warm, and you'll have three or four different species of parrot uh, along with all the other birds sitting in this tree, and you can just sit back and have a cup of coffee and just see the world coming to us. What kind of seasons do you have? Well, at the moment, horrible. Um... We normally get our rain, but it is very irregular. We normally get it starting about now. We start to get into storms, December, January, February, and even through into March, we get big rains. And then it gradually dries out and back to what it is now, which is very dry. But when we get these huge monsoonal... Well, what happens? If we get cyclones and monsoons, monsoonal influences come in from the Coral Sea or up down through the Gulf. They'll come that, that far in. To they you. do. They come right in. And we get these huge dumps of rain. Back in January of this year, on the 5th of January or 6th of January, we had a big depression came in inland and we had... It was more storm rain with this particular one rather than covering the whole region, but we had 10 inches in an hour and a half, two hours. And so it's like you're bone dry for <coughs> years and then someone... 
dumps a gigantic bucket on you. Is yeah, it is. Like? It is. But this particular fall did a lot of damage. It was so big and the country's so flat that I think we lost about $50,000 worth of fencing in a couple of hours. We're still in the process of putting them back up. What, just knocked it <clears> over? <throat> well, not only knocked it over, some of them scoured it out totally and they disappeared. Other places, they're totally buried. You can't see them anymore. It's just... what, what do you mean, like, from <clears throat> what, what raging waters? Yeah, because it's so flat, the water really builds up, and it's, the current wouldn't be strong like in a rainforest stream, but you get this huge volume of water, and it, it totally changes the landscape. In some places, it can build it up feet. In other areas, it gouges out new channels or takes heaps of silt away, and fences disappear. Grazier naturalist photographer <clears throat> Angus Emmett's my guest in conversation this morning. Angus, your family have uh, been in Noomba for, for quite a few years. When, tell me how and when they, your family first came to settle in that area. Well, my grandmother on my dad's side was living next door with her husband at Loch Earn, And Loch Earn's now a national park. But in the early days, most of the region was made up of these huge super properties... And in 1915, the, our Noombar block was balloted off Virgimont. Virgimont's a station to the north of us. It's still a million acres. But it was balloted off in 1915, and my grandmother and her husband drew that. And about that time, he had an accident, unfortunately, and you know, I don't think it was a quick process, but he died over a year or two. Oh, dear. When you, sorry, but just go back when you said ballot, did that mean they won it in a lottery or something? Well, you put your name in and it gets drawn out, but there's terms and conditions with that if you take this. What they were doing, as I said, the country was in a small number of huge blocks of land back then, and what the government was trying to do was to move more people into the country and split the country up a bit, make it available for more people. So they used to map these properties and take certain portions around the edges off and put them up for ballot. You put your name in, and when you, if you were lucky, you then had to have certain conditions. You had to build a house and build fences and improve the place. There was a whole host of terms and conditions. But, yes, that's how they first came to it. So were they your grandparents? That, that was there? my grandmother and her husband at that time, but he died oh. about that time. She was, my grandmother was originally a concert pianist from down around Sydney. A <laughs> concert pianist? Yep. <laughs> Whose so, idea was it to settle out in, uh, well, in one of the most remote parts <clears throat> of the world then? That seemed a fairly sensible choice. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow... Um, was it her idea or was it your grandfather's idea to, uh, to do that? Well, that wasn't my grandmother. That wasn't my grandfather. It was her first husband. Oh, and I, I presume it was a joint decision of theirs. Okay, at the time. To, all right. Uh, so but pull up sticks and, but and she decided to keep the block. She moved there. When she first got it in 1915, there was one fence on the eastern boundary that was just, was just virgin country apart from that. And, and so with that, with the death of her husband then, did that mean she had to run it on her own for a while? Yes, she employed people, but she had, well, for instance, no fences, lots of dingoes. They had sheep, so they had to actually have shepherds that used to take the sheep out during the day and put them into breaks, which was, because they didn't have wire, they'd actually form these, like... Yards, I guess you'd call them, stockyards. They'd get branches and broken off dead branches and build these breaks. And there still remains of them there now. So they'd walk the sheep out during the day and put them back in at night to stop the dingoes eating them. And a shepherd would watch them during the day? Yep, that was how it was in the early days. And then from there, your father took over the property? Well, what happened, a family friend came up from down at Maria, I think it was. It was down on the New South Wales coast, came up to help, and they eventually got married. The interesting part was she had two young children from the first marriage and she put them on a train back to Sydney because she just couldn't keep the land and manage education at that point in time. So they actually went by train, they were only really young, had a basket of tucker and stuff by train back to Sydney. And she stayed on, eventually remarried, and my dad is one of the results of that and he he took over running the place when he was 21 I think it was and he only retired oh, eight nine years ago or something like that at the age of 82 he's going strong in Longridge at the moment what do you what do you think about your grandmother <clears throat> taking leaving a life as a, a as a concert pianist 
and then having what was certainly a great deal of hardship, losing a husband and mm. sending kids away to boarding school and running a property where, I mean, what temperatures get up to 50 degree heat up in that part of the world at times? Yes, they? no air conditioning, corrugated no air con, iron, nothing. corrugated iron buildings. I think I don't think we realise how easy we get it these days. Back in those days, it was a three-day buggy ride to Longridge. And if the river came up, it could be shut for up to six months. It can still, even with the roads and bridges we've got now, we can still be shut off from Longridge via floodwaters for up to three months. So your father took on the property, and you, and you, that's, and you grew up on it. Yeah. You, you used to have sheep on it years and years ago. And, of course, sheep, sheep are disappearing from that part of Australia more and more. Do you remember that, that life, that shearing, shearing season and what would happen on the property during shearing season? Oh, very much so. I grew up with sheep and cattle all my life and sheep were a big part of it. Uh, it's just over the last 20 years, prices declined and it's been a whole, it's a complex situation. There's a whole heap of issues around what's happened, but gradually from a lot of areas, particularly in area, the sheep have retreated back to the north, northeast. And it's mainly cattle these days. But, yeah, sheep, we used to spend lots of time mustering and then shearing at start. And you'd have to be over, get up in the dark every morning and head out to the shearing shed and bring sheep in, putting sheep out, drafting and jetting for lice and blowfly and that sort of thing. And you'd get did, home in the dark. And did, did, uh, did shearing season mean that... Did the fact that there was shearing mean that it was a much more social culture then because you had a whole lot of shearers coming into an area? I uh, don't... Well, yes. Well, the towns. An interesting statistic, and I probably won't get it right, but just north of Longreach, there's a little town called Mudderborough. It's about 100 kilometres north of Longreach. And it had, I think, 12 to 16 shearing teams living in that town. There's none now. And you go back to Longreach, there's still a few, but there's just a huge reduction in people. They've all left the shearing industries not what it used to be. No, and it's like the disappearance of a whole culture too, isn't it? It is. Oh, formed yeah. the Labor Party and we have yep. all those old Shearer's songs like Click Go the Shears that were part of Australian culture. It seems to be slowly disappearing. Yeah, well, next door to Longridge we've got Bar Calden, which is where the Labor Party was actually formed. So, yeah, the shearing industry was a huge part of early inland Queensland. You're here in, the, in, uh, in, in, in town with your wife Karen at the moment. Um, was it hard to persuade a, a girl to come and live with you in, in that remote part of Australia, Angus? Mm. <laughs> She actually agreed very easily without even having a close enough look at it, probably. But I think I think Karen really enjoys it now. But I think in the early days it might have been a bit confronting. But she grew up in Mackay but came out to nurse for a couple of weeks in Charleville. And four and a half years later, she finally went back to the city to World Expo. She nursed at World Expo 88. And I'd met her in Longreach when she came to visit a friend just before then. So I went back and we sort of started going out seriously when World Expo was on. So, yeah, that was pretty neat. Western Queensland's been in drought since you took over. What's that meant to how you manage your station, Angus? Well, even though 2000s have been pretty much in drought, we have had a couple of periods in that where we have had some rain. So we've managed to actually fatten some stock and sell them, which is great because actually having an income is Quite an advantage when you're running a business. Isn't that nice to have an income? <laughs> <laughs> but if you go down not very far from us, there's places. I've got a friend that's had no stock on his property for eight years now. and What's he living on? Well, he's doing other things to make enough money to keep things ticking over. But then when it really rains, you need some serious money to buy stock back in. So it's challenging. Challenging indeed. How do you see the drought anyway? Do you see it as a cyclical thing? Um, it definitely is, but if we're to believe the data about the way climate's shifting, and I actually do believe it, I think there's a huge body of evidence there to support it, we probably will get bigger and more violent wet events, but they'll be interspersed with longer, drier periods, and how we actually are going to adapt to that is going to be very challenging, but it's something we need to give a lot of thought to. Yeah, so if you're if you're facing a future where the weather palette, with the weather patterns will be more marked, I suppose, and more violent when they change, yep. then you have to be ready for everything, anything. You do, and you've got to try and budget for it somehow. That's the challenging part. <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be trying times, particularly in the more arid parts of Australia, where it doesn't take a big change and 
bit longer dry periods, it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to how we manage the rivers too, and we need to ver- be very, very careful about how we do that. Indeed. And with, with those changes, the, the change is so very sudden. So suddenly you have no money and then you need money just like that yep. in order to actually, and actually make money out of the place. Yes, well, you have to have stock to make money and you don't get stock without money. So that's how, yeah, you can get caught in the debt trap very easily and you, you've got to think about that all the time and work out, try and work out what the season's going to do and how much feed you've got left and what options you've got and... If you make them too late, they might turn into not being options. So, You're listening to Conversations with Richard Feidler on ABC Local Radio and the World Wide Web. And we're taking you to one of the most remote parts of the world today because my guest is Angus Emmett, who is a grazier. And Angus has lived all his life on Noonbar Station, which is about about 140 k's southwest of Longreach in Queensland. But here's the thing. He's also a wildlife lover, a naturalist, and a collector. In fact, his kids actually call him Nature Boy. They call you Nature Boy? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> it's terrible do. how children patronise their parents. Well, they haven't got a lot of respect, have they? <laughs> <laughs> kids today, hey, kids today. How does your life as a grazier blend into your scientific life? Well, it actually blends in perfectly because it's interesting. A lot of scientists visit home because we've got the environment and we've got a friendly atmosphere for them to come out there, beds, etc. But they're tied to funding cycles and the ability to visit occasionally. I'm there all the time, so I see all the changes of the seasons. And I think a really good example of that, I, some years ago, I collected a daisy that was a new record for Queensland. And the Queensland Herbarium asked me to collect more material. It was another 10 years with the right rainfall event that they actually came back up again. A daisy? Yep. What, why is a daisy special there? Well, that particular species hadn't been collected in Queensland before. That was the first record for Queensland for that species, and they wanted some more material. But it was 10 years before it came back up again because you had to get the right amount of rain at the right time of the year to make it happen. Did that mean its seed had been lying dormant yep. in the soil all that time? Yes, and that's why there's such a huge opportunity for me out there. I'm there all the time and I see all the different cycles and I'm there when things happen. Whereas if you're a scientist in a university on the coast, not only you don't know when that's going to happen, but when it happens you haven't got the opportunity a lot of the time to duck out there, even if someone told you it was happening. So I'm there. What's a typical day like for you? On your property? Oh, when, whenever I go out on the bike. I spend a lot of time on a motorbike, either checking stock, checking waters, mustering, etc. And I always carry a, one of those camelback backpack things, so I've got a drink of water, but it's got a pack on it as well. So, What's in the pack? Oh, I carry some calico bags around in case I find a snake that I want to photograph and vials for insects and that sort of thing. So I've always got my eye, eye open and I'm heavily into photography as well, so i I'll grab things and photograph them and return them to where I found them. But you've got to take these opportunities. And because I'm there all the time, I do have these opportunities. Uh, you, you also collect roadkill, as we said before. Is it true, Angus, you stopped to pick up roadkill on the way to taking your wife to hospital to give birth? Is that no, true? Unfortunately, it is true, yeah. <laughs> 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 when she was in labour and you went, what did you spot? What was, what was so important? Oh, there was a pratt- very nice... Pratt and Cole did beside the road, and it only took a second to pick it up. <laughs> so once you've got these things, uh, what do you do with them once you've collected them? Well, it depends. With birds, oh, everything you collect, you have to collect good data. You have to collect your latitude and longitude and what the habitat is and the date and all that sort of stuff. Specimens without data are useless, but with different animals, you use different techniques. Birds, I could skin them. It takes too long. I just put them in the freezer with labels on them that correspond with the catalogue and let the Queensland Museum handle them. But, for instance, with all reptiles, I'll initially freeze them until I get time, but I've got a lab set up at home and I'll take some tissue out for genetic work and put that in absolute alcohol or RNA later or something like that, put it in the freezer. It's all cross-referenced, cross-labelled, and then have to fix them in formalin because formalin's a really good tissue fixative. And then you just put put the number on them and put them in absolute alcohol in big tubs. 
What sort of frozen dead animals have you had in your freezer, Angus? Oh, we've had everything in there over the years. We even had a koala there at one stage. We were <laughs> Karen's, some of Karen's family are down the Central Highlands and we picked up a roadkill koala on the way back. I just, I just can't imagine reaching into a freezer and putting a, bringing out some sort of frozen koala that would sort of be scowling at you, sort of. <laughs> well, one time Karen was sort of rooting around in the freezer trying to find a lump of corn meat and came out with a turtle. <laughs> These days I've got my own freezer, but I must admit I've overflowed back into one of the others. You come, you turn up with something like a dead pelican or something like that, they take up a fair bit of room. You've had a, you've had a pelican in your freezer? Yeah, I've got a busted in there at the moment, you know, the big plains turkeys. But I have got my own dedicated freezer now. It's right, have to be a big freezer to fit all that beak in. <laughs> yeah. <it? laughs> have you got a lab set up on your property? Oh, definitely. I, I'm heavily into books as well, so I've got to study in a lab, and I've, I've got it all set up there. And I've, it's, it's, it's actually really good in the summer because you can go out really early and work until about lunchtime when it's really hot, and then you can turn the air conditioner on and go in there and play around in there till it cools off a bit. <laughs> Do you, do you see do you see beauty a certain kind of beauty in your specimens, or are you always looking at them with a cool scientific eye? Oh no, it's a huge amount of beauty. You take something like oh the splendid wren out our way. You get one of theirs and just look at the feathers in the sunlight, and it's beauty that's almost unequalled. It's just there's just huge beauty in well, they're more beauty when they're alive, but they're still beautiful even as specimens. What do you know about the indigenous history of your land? Um, unfortunately. The tradition, all the traditional owners of our part of the world were moved off out of that landscape about 100 years ago. So I haven't got a lot of opportunity to talk to TOs. But when you move around the landscape through all through Western Queensland, there's signs everywhere. There's old camp for fires, there's grinders, there's axes, there's just out behind us, there's some big borer rings, initiation sites. There's sign everywhere. Are you still able to discover them even now? These Are there still new oh, yeah. things that you spot all the time? Oh, yeah. It's, well, for instance, I was talking before about how water moves soil around. Well, when it does that, it buries things and exposes things as well. So in the Channel Country, you've always got things coming to the surface you haven't seen before. Where did this passion for collecting natural specimens start, Angus? Well, I've always been interested. I can't remember not being interested, but... There was very little direction in the early days. There was virtually no literature around. I can remember Cayley's What Bird Is That in, in the early days and they had these minute pictures that you're trying to compare with life and see if they were the same bird species. But there, was just, there wasn't much out there. Can you, do, do, you, do you think you know what, what's at the core of that interest? I mean, it's, it's, if it's been with you since you were a child, what, what do you think lies underneath that, if there is anything that lies underneath that, that fascination with the minutiae? of the natural world around you? I I don't know. Um, I look at a landscape and not only admire it and look for photographic possibilities, but I really like to know, I don't know why, but I like to know what things are, the individual components. And if I don't know what they are, I take it upon myself to find out. I just... I just have this need for some reason. I don't know. Is it it trying to uncover the the hidden miniature machinery of the world or something? Well, like that. I think it helps you understand what makes things tick. I think otherwise you've got a bit of a superficial view of it. Um, we talk about managing landscape. If we don't even know what's in it, it's like trying to service a car and not know what's inside, under the tappet cover. I just don't know. Without knowing, I don't know how we're meant to seriously consider ourselves land managers. What was life like on the station for you as a kid? Oh, it was great. Um, I had a brother and a sister. Still got a brother and a sister. <laughs> um, we used to do correspondence school and school of the air through Mount Isa. And in the breaks, we'd be out lunch and after school, we'd be out playing tennis or playing cricket and out in the bush chasing goannas around or whatever. We used to have a great time. And and as you said, there was quite a social life back then. There used to be tennis days and race meetings and so on weekends we usually be going off to something. So I think as a kid it was a pretty idyllic life. Who taught you how to pin insects? Um, I guess the start there was in Longreach the Plague Locust Commission had an office and they were interested to learn not only about the plague locust but the other grasshoppers around the area. So they actually provided me with some pins and some knowledge of what to do and I guess that 
kicked off the entomology side of what I do. What species have been named after you? Uh, I've been pretty lucky in that regard. I, originally, the first species that was named after me was a uh, skink, but it looks it's almost legless. You've got to look really, really closely to see if it's got legs. Well, it's almost a snake, in other words. Well, it, it looks a little bit like a snake. And that was in the garden at home, but it was a bit different, and I had the honour of having that named after me. So what happened? You just discovered it and took it into the museum and said, oh, look at this. Oh, I did take some into the museum, and it was very close to another species, but somewhat looked a little bit different. It had two toes instead of one. We had to put it on the microscope, basically, to see those toes. But we then did genetics on it as well, and it proved conclusively that it was separate. So Patrick Cooper and a few other people put my name on it, which was wonderful. And a bird as well? Uh, a subspecies of the Splendid Wren. Uh, Dick Shoddy from, and Ian Mason from down at the National Wildlife Collection named the subspecies of Splendid Wren from our part of the world. But he named it, they named it Emetorum, Malura Splendens Emetorum. <laughs> and em, the ending denotes whether it's male, female or plural. And it was called Emetorum after Karen and I. Oh, which is nice. Really, really nice. Oh, that's really lovely. Yeah. What, a, what a nice gesture that is. Yeah. Husband and, <laughs> husband and, and wife. Because Karen's put a fair bit into things over the years. A fair bit of effort. How many species of cicada alone are on your property? Well, I've been lucky enough to have one of them named after me, uh, Thophoremetai, which is equal to Australia's largest cicada. It's a pretty massive thing. But I've been working with Max Moles, who was at the Australian Museum, and he's now living up in North Queensland, and... Three people from the, or four people from the University of Connecticut are, that are looking at cicadas worldwide. And we're up to 30 species on our property now, and of those, about half are new to science. 30 species of cicada, yep. and about half are new to science. Yep, and this is a big, obvious insect, so just extrapolate that out to the small and small insects that we don't see much and don't get collected. Insect life, the invertebrates, we know virtually nothing about. We just scratch the surface. So if you're comparing the rate, the, I don't know, if you, if you care to make a wild stab, the proportion of known species to unknown species or un, unnamed species, if you like, on your property, what would it be like? Well, I'd say with vertebrates, we know most of them. There's still some particularly reptiles that are new on our place. But if you look at invertebrates, I would be very surprised if... Ooh, I'd be very surprised if 30 or 40% of them had been scientifically described. It might be a lot less than that. So not even half? Not well, even... That, that, that's worldwide, but some areas... Western Queensland's hardly been looked at at all, so... Sounds yeah. like we should all go out there with a butterfly net or something. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not, known not quite that easy, but, yeah. <laughs> There's just this huge volume of invertebrates around the world that we don't know much about, don't even know what they are. Now, Angus, uh, you left at school at high school, but you've been invited to do a PhD at Harvard. Are you going to do it? Oh, probably not at this point in time. Life's pretty full. But I do have a friend that's over at Harvard and suggested I might go over. What that came from, I I did all my school at home via correspondence and school of the air, and I finished after grade 10, and I've worked. I've been working full, full-time since then. But some years ago, the University of Central Queensland gave me an honorary Master's of Science for the work I'm doing with science and also with natural resource management. And, yeah, so as Scott suggested, I might like to go over there and do it. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you thinking about it seriously at a later point in life when oh. your life might not be so hectic? I, mean, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. It would be neat to do. I know. It would be a fun thing to do to go from out in Channel Country to Cambridge, Massachusetts to <laughs> smoke a, a pipe. and uh, It would be a bit different, wouldn't it? It would be a bit different <laughs> as well. Uh, I have to ask you this question. Are you a reptile lover as oh, well? Oh, Definitely. Recently, a friend of mine out in Longreach, Steve Wilson, there's two Steve Wilsons. There's one that works in Longreach. They both publish, they both are into reptiles and they both publish on reptiles. But the Longreach, Steve Wilson and I recently put out a field guide to snakes of Western Queensland, which was a fun exercise and it's actually been very well received and I think it's being used educationally. A lot of people are buying it and using it. Angus, what do snakes do for you? Ooh. What do they, what do, they well, do for you? They're just beautiful animals. They're, I know they're venomous, or some of them are venomous, but they're just beautiful, beautiful skin, beautiful colours, beautiful way of moving. They're just they're, they're pretty magic animals. 
you, you mentioned you photographed them. Um, how, how do you get it? <laughs> How do you get a venomous snake to sit still to, to a point where you're, everyone's relaxed enough to take a photograph? It can be quite challenging. <laughs> well, what we usually do is, well, if we've got a large venomous salapid, a large venomous snake, we'll put it in a bag and keep it overnight because when you first find a snake, they're pretty, they're scared, they're nervous, and they don't want to be there. They want to go somewhere else. So if you treat them gently, put them in a bag, treat them gently, keep them overnight, you can take them out to a good spot next morning, and... You put them down, you can get some photos. Sometimes you have to use a cushion or a bag and let them curl up underneath it and get yourself set up. It's pretty hard to do on your own. You need a couple of people that can handle reptiles. But, but yeah, you can do it. <laughs> right, take the picture now. <laughs> be like that. Well, you take lots of photos and don't use very many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Grazier photographer, snake lover, Angus Emmett is my guest this morning. You said earlier that you, you you were pretty much persuaded by the science of climate change that uh, some kind of climate change is is underway. What what is what have you noticed already to the changes in the in the land and the ecology of where you live over time? Because it's such a slow thing, it's hard to put a finger on it. But if you look at the river systems, particularly, well, the rivers of Western Queensland that flow down into Lake Eyre, the Lake Eyre Basin rivers. The refugial water holes in them are critically important and how far the water gets down regularly uh, with the low flows and things. And uh, it, the water at times is having longer periods and not getting as far, which has got a huge issue for refugial water holes. But how do you tell if the 10-year drought we're having is just an anomaly or whether it's part of a longer-term um, system, but if you actually look at all the science, there's no doubt that things are changing, and there's absolutely no doubt that although there's always been natural variation and there always will be, there's an anthrop- anthropomorphic or human induced change on top of that. There's no doubt it at all. The science is there's a few people out there, there's a few scientists, there's a very small number of actual climate scientists, but there is a couple that are denying it. But there's just huge consensus around the world that it is happening and it's a huge issue. And we need to actually make some management decisions now so we don't get hurt later. Does, does that kind of knowledge make you a better grazier? Do you think? Uh, of... In the short term, I don't think it will probably make that much difference because we've got so much variability in such long periods of dry already that we're probably just going to be doing the same things we're doing now, but we're going to have longer periods. So it will change things a bit, but... I suppose one thing we we even know, even in in cities, is the interconnectedness of of species populations and what might happen if one species should fail, how that would affect other populations. Well, we know that it's a huge issue. We don't know how big the problem is, but one thing we do know is there's another huge species extinction happening right around the world right now, and even in Australia. We've had trouble in the Murray-Darling for a long time, but right across northern Australia, there's whole suites of species in trouble. There's... We don't know all the reasons for it, but there's a big crash happening, and that's going to have... We might say, well, what's it mean to us? But the reality is that it does mean... Even if you ignore the need to look after nature and the the intrinsic value of it, it's going to have huge impacts on us, and we won't know what they are exactly or when, but it'll hurt us. Is that one of the biggest misconceptions you could make, again, we're talking about that wake and fright scene of the big panorama, is you're tempted to see it, you know, if you don't live in that part of the world, as something simple. And it's so categorical, it's so simple. Mm. But in fact, it's a, it, a deeply complex place. And as you say, like the, the reason for things happening may be deeply interconnected and extremely complex. So oh, is, it, exactly. is it very hard then to figure out what's really going on? Oh, it's very, very hard. And I find it really amazing that we can send a man to the moon, but we could take a one small paddock and we nowhere in the world do we know all the processes that make one small area of land tick over even though we can send a man to the moon so it's we've we've got a long way to go in our understanding of what makes things work and what impacts will happen when we change things we're starting to feel it but we still don't fully understand it 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 sounds like the more you know about where you live you realize how much you don't know. I think that applies to everywhere and everything. The more you know, the more you realise <laughs> you're scratching the surface. And I think yeah, when you get to that point, you realise that it's a long journey. But 
uh, it just really scares me with river systems around the world, what's happening to them and how they're all dying. And I just think, for instance, with the Lake Here Basin rivers, they're still in, well, they're the most significant large dryland rivers in the on the planet, and they're the only ones left that aren't severely impacted by human dams, irrigation, whatever. So we've got a great opportunity. We've got lots of challenges, but we've got a great opportunity to keep them that way, and that's that's my backyard. In conservation terms, you say that you need to be political. Why, why do you why do you say that? Well, it doesn't matter how much science you have. The reality is, with well, particularly, I, it's probably not more so. But I was going to say with Western civilizations, but politics and the policies of politics drive land management. It's an unfortunate fact of life, but it doesn't matter how good your management is or how good the science is. Politics ultimately is one of the main, uh, oh, how would you put this, politics comes into all decision-making at some level. Yeah, because there's disagreements and they, they must yeah. be negotiated, and that by its nature is politics. Yeah, and it's interesting mm. just looking at rivers, and we can even have huge amounts of science about what's affecting rivers, but trying to actually put it right after the event, as we see with the Murray-Darling, it's almost impossible. You had some input into the uh, in Queensland's wild rivers legislation. What what were you able to do there, Angus? The Premier at the last election said she would put wild rivers listings over the Cooper Georgina Diamantina, and I'd really congratulate her for that. I think wild rivers legislation is the only legislation in Australia, and Queensland's got it, so that's great, that actually, at this point in time it's the only legislation that sort of is overarching protection for rivers. And... These rivers are hugely significant. They support a huge pastoral industry that's had some impacts, but not a lot. It can, it can actually live in the landscape without destroying it. And tourism, ecotourism, we've got clean green beef, OB beef. OB beef is organic beef for those that don't know. Um, we've just got a huge opportunity now with these rivers having not been destroyed to actually get some overarching legislation, look long-term, do some serious planning with all the community and look at what our future wants, what we'd like our future to be. And in doing that, we can actually make some sensible decisions, hopefully, because when you just make these ad hoc decisions in a vacuum, you end up with dead rivers. And you can kill a river in five or ten years. We've seen it happening. And we can't afford to kill these ones. So I, I just think it's wonderful that we're taking these first steps towards doing it. It won't be the be-all and end-all, but it's the first step in actually hopefully keeping these rivers as living entities in their own right. It, it's not your patch of the world, but Cape York uh, Indigenous leader Noel Pearson's been really critical of the Wild Rivers legislation, saying that this will strangle Aboriginal enterprise <coughs> in the area. And also he, he, takes it, he seems to take it as an insult because it suggests that Aboriginal people can't manage those, those systems. I don't know. What do you say to that? Oh, I don't agree with Noel at all. I respect his right to say that, but if you have a look at it hasn't impacted any indigenous enterprises up there and it's actually going it's actually supported by a lot of the indigenous people on Cape York and it's actually going to give them a future because with dead rivers you haven't got a future this is i think it's a great opportunity for the indigenous people to get in there and work with the legislation and with the other rest of the community and the government to secure a future for themselves just uh, just going back right to the start of our conversation now uh, I'm a guy who's lived all over the place. I've, I've, you know, I've got moved, even as a kid, we moved from place to place to place. You were born, you've lived in the one place your whole life. What do you think about that, given that increasingly more and more people live the way I do, I suppose, in Australia, and let fewer and fewer live the way you do, staying in the one spot? Yeah, it's interesting. In, I, it's a hard one to answer because I haven't experienced the other side of life, but I find I do get still get to travel a lot and see lots of parts of the world, but living in one spot, you really get to know it, and you, I've, I don't know, i become part of the landscape rather than just being a dot on it. I'm sort of, I live there, I'm part of that landscape, and I've just got a feeling of belonging, I guess. Do you feel like one of the trees, that, not the dead one, of course, but <laughs> one of the trees around your property? Well, probably, and I'll end up being one of the dead ones, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, th- I just think you get to know country, and when I say no, it's not just the physical, it's just, it's a lot more than that. You get to be part of it. It just sort of, uh, I don't know, you become part of the landscape and it's part of you and 
the sort of pretty blurred edges there. And on a day like today, do you feel a little untethered then from it? Or uh, I love travelling around the world. I feel I get a little bit uptight in big cities. I'm used to wide open spaces and all the noise and people. I do get a bit uptight, but I love travelling to different parts of the world, particularly looking at flora, fauna, landscapes, yeah. Well, it's been really great to meet you, Angus, and uh, I've got to thank Greg and Lisa Barrett for insisting we speak to you, and uh, they were quite insistent about that. So thank you to Greg and Lisa for that, and thank you so much for being my guest in Conversations today. Oh, thank you, Richard, and I'll have to cra- catch up with Greg as well, I think. Yeah, give him a hard time. <laughs> I will. And you've got some people to dob into us as well as Conversation Subjects. We'll have to talk to you about that afterwards. Okay. But thank you so much, Angus. Thanks, Richard.